Good evening, dear friends. Welcome to Kardec Radio, our weekly program from the West Coast in California. It's Life After Life Spirit Reports by Alan Kardec. We're basing our studies on Heaven and Hell, the beautiful book, Heaven and Hell by Alan Kardec. In the second half of the book, we have many, many, many spirit reports spirit reports from the happy spirits to the suicides that we're studying right now and the suicide cases are a little bit difficult because there is a lot of pain that these spirits report back to us but every single case that we've been discussing and studying and reading and understanding have so much to teach us so much of how we can do it better how we can maybe even follow their elite in the case of them being happy spirits, but also trying to avoid certain pitfalls because hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we will have a life after life that is manageable. Maybe we're even going to be of service on the other side and not suffering as much as at least the suicide cases. So it gives, it gives us or sheds new light on committing suicide. We know from Alan Kardec in the Spirits book <clears throat> that we do not have the right to take our own lives and we don't have the right to take other people's lives. And that even extends to the fetus, to unborn children. So having said that, we're today looking at a new case um, that was a suicide. And it was a man um, of 67 years old uh, who um, committed suicide. But before we do that, I want to say hi. There are certain, this number of people who've joined. Thank you so much for doing that. I only see Tony um, who said hi. Hi, Tony. Thank you so much for joining. It's a pleasure to have you, dear friend. And there's a few more, but I don't see their names. So please feel free to say hi and say your name and uh, so we can, we can well, warmly welcome you. So before we study our new case tonight, and if we can, please close your eyes and let us connect with God and Jesus, Mother Mary, and all the healing doctors and spirits on high who are present tonight, helping us, helping us to understand this new case understanding the gravity of suicide and the repercussions of that. And also let us open our hearts and minds and harmonize ourselves to the messages from on high, the messages that serve us via Alan Kardec and his dedicated service to help us understand of how to conduct ourselves in this lifetime, planting seeds, that will bring us a nourishing harvest in the future. We're with, filled with gratitude for the dedication of the spirit world, bringing, using different vessels to bring these important teachings to us. And we pray that we will be open in heart and mind to understand and feel and deeply feel the message so that we can use them for our own inner transformation in our daily effort. And with this, we ask for permission to start our study session for tonight. And so be it. Thank you, friends. So we're going to page in the second half of Heaven and Hell. We're going to page 393. Um, our friend is called Louvet. Francois Simon. Um, and let us go to the end of the message, actually, which tells us what this is, what he was all about. So in a journal du Havre, which was a daily magazine, in 1857, the following could be found. Yesterday at 4 p.m., the transients on the wharf were dismayed by a terrible incident. A man threw himself off the tower and was dashed on the stones. 
He was an old barge hauler. Now the footnote teaches us that a barge hauler is one of the hardest occupations of manual workers. And his dependence on liquor drove him to suicide. His name was Francois Victor Simon Louvet. The body was taken to the home of one of his daughters on Cordier Street. He was 67 years old. So he jumped off a tower. He was an alcoholic. So let us see. About six years later, he was invoked. Now somebody left a message. Let us see. There is Carlos Tremora. Hello, dear friend. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. They, they are to be congratulated. We have to use our technologies to connect with good fluids. That is so true. And um, the, about the charity and the elevation of spirits that is caused in the human being, just as relief from spiritual pain goes with the action of charity. Yes. Thank you so much, dear Carlos, for pointing that out because ultimately at the end of the day, it is charity that is our salvation as Alan Kardec taught us in the gospel according to spiritism. There is no salvation without charity. So thank you so much for summarizing and pointing that out, Carlos. So back to our friend. So six years after his jump, he was invoked. And here is what he says. And I invite you to open your hearts and really feel the pain of the spirit because it's all about feeling the experiences of these spirits, which hopefully will leave an imprint in our minds and hearts so that we will avoid the pitfalls that this particular spirit had to experience. Will you take, this, these are his words, will you take pity on a poor wretch who has suffered to dreadful torture for so long. Oh, the emptiness, the space. I'm falling, falling. Help me. My God, I had such a miserable existence. I was a poor devil. I often suffered hunger in my old age, and so I took to drinking and became ashamed and sick of it all. I wanted to die. So I jumped. Oh my God, what a moment. Why did I want to put an end to my life if I was so close to the end anyway? Pray so I won't have to keep on seeing this emptiness below me. I'm going to dash myself upon those stones. I beg of you, you who know about the misery of those who no longer belong to this world. Even though you don't know me, I am addressing you because I am suffering so. Why do you want to more proof? Why do we want more proof? I am suffering. Isn't that enough? If I were hungry instead of enduring this terrible suffering, which is imperceptible to you, you would not hesitate to help me out with a morsel of bread. So I'm asking you to pray for me. I can't stay long. Ask any of these happy ones who are here right now and you will find out who I was. Pray for me. This is the end of what Francois Simon Louvet said. He's telling us that six years later after his jump, he is still in agony. He is still feeling as if he was just about to jump. He is still re-experiencing the moment of jumping and hitting the pavement. Can we imagine that really? Can we imagine really six years of this pain? It's hard to imagine, I agree. If we think back right now of where we were and what we did six years ago, it seems rather far away, probably to a point that we can't even remember what happened six years ago, right? And then if we can just have that mental fantasy 
of imagining six years of continuous jumping off that tower. I know friends, this is not very uplifting in a way, but I see it positively anyway, because thanks to this beautiful spirit coming back and Alan Kardec and his dedicated service through those mediums at the time, we know what not to do. And hopefully we have a chance, even if we don't feel ever close to suicide or drinking or whatever it might be because we are down and depressed, hopefully we will be reaching out to those who may feel like that. Because we, studying spiritism, are aware of the repercussions. We, so to speak, and this is not coming from an egoic place, but we know better, which means that A, we won't ever take our lives and B, we will hopefully reach out to those who are feeling desperate and desolate so we can help them to avoid these mistakes, right? So let us see. The medium's guide is now reporting to us. This spirit who has addressed you just now, my son, was a poor wretch who had to undergo the trial of poverty. So during his lifetime, Francois was poor. And we know that poverty is a trial as much as wealth. As a matter of fact, the trial of wealth is even stronger, is even more difficult. Why? Because we have a pretty good chance of not remembering that we need to share of our wealth. We forget that our wealth is a gift from God. It's a loan from on high that needs to be shared. But since most of us are suffering from the same disease called selfishness, we forget. So that is why we learn in the Spirits book by Alan Kardec that the trial of wealth may be more challenging than the trial of poverty, which usually teaches us surrender, resignation, which is surrender of the heart. So our friend was suffering from poverty, but was overcome with disgust at the same time. And how often does that happen when we are poor, when people are poor, that they get disgusted, disgusted with their lives. They don't see the door. They don't see the bigger picture. Courage failed him. We're learning. Courage failed him. And instead of looking to heaven as he should have, he turned to the bottle and sank to the extremes of despair. So let us pause for a moment. Because courage is one of those things that we would like to look a little bit deeper at. Because courage is one, one of the um, virtues that we need to nourish in ourselves. Why is that? So when we look at the gospel according to Spiritism, chapter 11, which is loving our neighbor, Emmanuel in his clarity teaches us something quite important about courage. And it is in the chapter labeled, named selfishness. So we're asking, why is courage linked to selfishness, correct? Strange, not quite clear. But if we go to page 193, if you like to follow along, um, the title is Selfishness. Emmanuel says, Selfishness is the target at which all true believers must aim their weapons, their strength, and their courage. So it is selfishness that we need to aim all of our weapons at, and we need to do it with strength and courage. Now, why do we need courage to combat selfishness in us? Why do you think that? Why may that be the case? Let us see how Emmanuel helps us understand that. He says, I say courage because more courage is needed to overcome oneself than to overcome other people. There it is. So for us to look at ourselves, to understand ourselves, know thyself, was already inscribed 
at the Oracle of Delphi. It's an ancient teaching that we need to know ourselves most and foremost so that we can understand and see what we need to shift in ourselves. And to know ourselves, of course, St. Augustine helped us to understand in the Gospel and the Spirit's book, how can we best get to know ourselves first and foremost? Well, you may remember that the best way to do that is the nightly review. So before we go to bed, we carve out a few minutes, maybe five minutes, and we go over our day that we just completed and we see where we need to work on ourselves. So we look at ourselves and our actions and our thoughts and our words and how we dealt with all the situations and the vicissitudes of life every single evening. And it is actually quite easy once we really get into the practice because our conscience will automatically bring up those moments or that moment in the day we just completed that needs a little more work. And then we have the beautiful opportunity to wake up in the morning next day. First of all, take this opportunity into our intelligent sleep with via prayer and then work on it the next day and maybe even make amends. So we need to know ourselves and for that we need courage because for us to look at ourselves we need courage but then to actually overcome our shortcomings which are most of the time if not always based and rooted in our selfishness and pride we need courage according to Emmanuel. So this is something one aspect of courage and this is one aspect that likely our friend was lacking but there is more now let us go to paul and stephen the beautiful book written by emmanuel by the spirit emmanuel through shiko shavia we know that Saul, who became later on paul had moments where he looked back to his past and he said oh golly what have i done and he felt a certain amount of despair. At one point in the book, his fiance and lover, Abigail, who had already transitioned, appeared to him and said to him, Paul, love everything and everybody. This was his, her recipe for him to courageously get over his feelings of self-pity she said, don't look back, look forward. And here's the recipe of, for you to continue your life as a mission of fruit of Jesus Christ. She said, love everything and everybody, Paul. And she said, work as hard as you can. Always work as hard as you can. Hope in the future, always. Always have hope. And Forget and forgive the incomprehension of others. That was her recipe for him to overcome his feelings of self-pity, to be able to courageously continue on the path of serving, of aligning his will with God's will. And then, after we're digesting that, because whatever was taught to Paul is of course our own recipe for, for success, right friends? So it is Abigail's really talking to us right now. So that we remember to in our everyday life to love everything and everybody. And yes, it's not easy. And to always work hard and to always have hope and to forgive and forget the incomprehension of others. Later on, towards the end of his life, and this is really exciting, when we go to the book Living Spring, there is a chapter called Courageously. And it starts with something that Paul then later on in his life wrote to the Corinthians. And this is what he said after he learned the lesson from Abigail. He then wrote to the Corinthians, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, Act courageously, be strong. He took the lesson and it became himself. 
and he passed it on to the Corinthians. And in this beautiful chapter 90, which you can find in the book Living Spring by Emmanuel through Chico Xavier, he says, Be on your guard in the daily struggle. Stand firm in the faith when faced with the storm. And as an aside, just to pause for a second, this is for us to learn of what our friend, what was his name, Francois, I think. Yeah, Francois did not know, unfortunately, during his life. And this is what he missed, and that is why he jumped. Part of why he jumped. It's all part, it's a bigger picture. But this is our lesson, so that what he was lacking was courage. We're just trying to tie it back into our case so that you're not thinking we're jutting off into the deep dark forest here. That is not our intention, but it's all about courage. So we want to learn about courage so we can do it differently, right? So be on your guard in the daily struggle. Stand firm in the faith when faced with the storm. Act courageously in every difficult situation. Be strong in suffering in order to receive its lessons of light. Still today, Paul's advice to the Corinthians is clothed in surprising appropriateness. And we agree, right friends? We agree. This is what we need. This is a re recipe for success that is as pertinent to ourselves 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years later. And... Paul had learned the lesson of courage and he passed it on to the Corinthians and now to us. He says further, in order for us to receive the substantial qualities of redemption, we must have the courage of those who trust in the Lord and in themselves. Remember our friends Francois, instead of connecting upwards to Jesus and the good spirits to connect with God, he took to the bottle. It is funny that alcohol is called spirit, right? Spirits. Yeah, it's almost like it's the same word, <laughs> but it's the wrong direction, right? It's probably a desire to connect with spirit, but it's not the right road. So then he says, a flood of unreasonable tears is worthless before a wrong that has been committed. And that is exactly what he learned from Abigail. Don't look back, Paul look forward, keep serving. It is our duty to repent of any evil we may have done, but to continuously feel sorry about it is wasting our time in redeeming it. Then the story goes on. Um, you may read it yourself. We're just picking out a few thing, simple things, uh, uh, certain sections. Um, Christians are not students that allow themselves undeserved rest. Remember, Abigail said, work always. Disciples of a master who served whoever needed him until his final testimony on the cross, they must toil at sowing and harvesting the infinite good, being on their guard, helping and acting courageously. We are invited to go through our difficulties with courage and while we are serving in doing the good. That is our invitation for us tonight, dear friends. That is a recipe for success. And we're reminded of chapter 10 in Thought and Life. The chapter is called Understanding, where Emmanuel, also Emmanuel, invited us to do the shackles that we created for ourselves during our life. We need to seek goodness. We need to feel goodness. We need to visualize goodness. And we need to mold goodness with all the resources we have. See how it all ties in together. Emmanuel at different times, through his dictations to Chico Xavier, is teaching us the same lessons with slightly different words and different angles. And here on top of it, we have Alan Kardec, who brings this beautiful case of Francois to us, who is indirectly teaching us the same lesson, indirectly, because our 
friend Francois did not, he was not courageous. All right, friends, let's see, is there more about courage? Oh yeah, there's also Jesus in the Home, the beautiful book, Jesus in the Home by Neo Lucio. See, we have a triangulation going on now. We have Neo Lucio Emmanuel and Alan Kardec teaching us the same. There is a chapter on page 103 called The Forgotten Gift. You may have read it. In The Forgotten Gift, Jesus tells us about a man who had the merit of receiving gifts. And so he asked for a lot of different things. And we're not going to mention it all, but this is a beautiful chapter on, on page 103, The Forgotten Gift. But all he asked for Every single thing turned out to be not exactly what he thought would help him or make him happy. And in the end, he realizes what mistake he made. And he says, let's see. In his quest for happiness, he had forgotten about the greatest of all the gifts that can uphold a person in the world. And this is a lesson for us. What is the greatest gift in the world that can uphold us? What is that? What is the greatest gift in the world that can uphold us in, in this world, in our lives? The gift of courage, friends. Isn't it amazing? Here's Neo Lucio teaching us the same thing. The gift of courage. Courage produces enthusiasm and good spirits with which to carry out the work that is needed each and every day. So courage gives us enthusiasm and good spirits. Wonderful, isn't it? Isn't it so uplifting? We're so grateful that we have these beautiful books and these beautiful teachings. Thanks to the good spirits. Thanks to Jesus Christ and God that we know exactly of how to get through our lives most happily and most effectively and efficiently. All we need to do is just practice. We need discipline, right? That's what Emmanuel taught, um, told um, Shiko Shavya, that he only needed one thing to get through life and write all the books. And it was number one, discipline, number two, discipline, and number three, discipline. So we have all the teachings, we have all the answers. Now we just need the discipline to do our nightly review, to get to know ourselves better, to remember the lessons of courage, and of course, always charity, and so forth. So let's see. So we continue here. So we learned about courage. And then, um, so he put an end to his sad trial by jumping off the Tower of Francis on July 1857. Take pity on this poor soul, uh, the medium's guide is telling us. He's not very advanced, but he knows enough about the future life to suffer and to desire a new trial. Now, he were being told to pray to God to grant him grace and you will be doing a good deed. So we're invited to pray, to pray for this suffering soul. We're invited to pray for this suffering soul. So we may ask ourselves, why do we need or why should we be praying for him? Remember, Francois actually asked us to pray for him too. And the Spirit's Guide is really echoing this as well. Well, we know that prayer is a form of charity. It's a form of moral charity, which we learn in the Gospel according to Spiritism. There's the material charity, which is when we actually give something to other people. But there's also the moral charity, of which prayer is one form. So we can always be helpful by praying for others. And we may remember that there's three components to prayer. There is the worshipping part. Then there is the request, when we make a request. And then there is the expression of gratitude to the divinity, to Jesus, to the good spirits. So those are the three components. We also know that it is an overflow from our own hearts and minds and a connection with God. So in the chapter, 
in the Gospel According to Spiritism, chapter 27, Ask and You Shall Receive, on page 389, we learn that prayer is an invocation. By means of prayer, we communicate thought with the being to whom the prayer is addressed. So praying is communicating thought. But we also know from the book Thought and Life that thinking and feeling are connected. And they are the ones, thought and, and feelings. It's like a ping pong ball. We think something and as a result we feel something. Or we experience something, we feel something and then thoughts get formed. While with prayer, it is this connection of the heart and the mind that communicates. So when we actually go to Thought and Life, chapter 95, we find, uh, chapter 26, we find a whole chapter on prayer. So here Emmanuel tells us that prayer, so we, we already learned that prayer is an invocation, right? And we also learned from Alan Kardec that prayer is thought that we communicate, thoughts and feelings that we communicate. And in chapter 26, prayer in the book Thought and Life, Emmanuel teaches us that prayer is a divine journey. It's a divine journey of the mirror of our soul aiming towards the higher realm in order to reflect its greatness. So we picture a mirror of our soul directed towards the higher realms, reflecting, connecting and reflecting back, bringing the thoughts over and attracting back. Prayers like a live appeal to the powers of the heavenly spirit Prayer is like a live appeal to the powers of the heavenly spirit. Emmanuel says, imagine a mirror. Imagine a mirror turned towards the sun. The mirror is turned towards the sun to reflect its brightness into a dark pit. So when we express our thoughts and our feelings in prayer and we connect to the higher realms. It is like we turn our mirror of mind and heart towards the sun of the divinity and we reflect it back into us, into our potentially darkness that we carry. And the more we pray and we do this exercise of reflecting in and out, the, the more aligned we will become with God's world, the clearer our life will be. Let us see, he says one more thing, to pray is to align oneself with the greatest source of power in the universe. With the greatest source of power in the universe, why wouldn't we want to pray? He, this chapter is really beautiful to read. I warmly recommend it. He also gives us examples in from nature in this example in this chapter but also he gives us examples from our lives so in this chapter which teaches us if you read it that we don't always have to just sit and pray it is every focus thinking and feeling that we have during our days is a form of prayer and at that moment we're asking ourselves what are we focusing on mentally and feeling wise during our days primarily is it something that connects us and nourishes our soul and connects us with the higher realms? Or are we indulging in lower thought forms? Those are prayers too. Those are the so-called infernal prayers. And then those are things we manifest as a result. So it, almost everything is a prayer or can be a prayer. And it's something to be conscious of. And in this book, Thought is Life, Thought and Life, we yeah this is the title um we really learn to be more vigilant about our thinking and what we reflect so um yeah so we're being asked to pray for this spirit um to help him and 
you might remember that a few weeks ago we had a spirit, a suffering spirit. Um, the name was Michael. Michael, um, what's the name? Michael August, August or Michel August, and he was still very, very strongly connected to his physical form after years and suffering tremendously. And he was always asking, please pray for me, pray over my dead body. Do you remember? So we asked ourselves back then, why would he ask for us to pray over his dead body? And again, I want to repeat, he was still very much connected via his peri spirit to his physical form. And it sounds like our friend Francois is not disconnect, quite disconnected either yet because for six years he still experiences seeing this moment of his body uh, falling. So he must be still linked to his body too. And in that chapter of Michel Auguste, we learned that praying over, it was in heaven and hell. Let's see, on page 352, let's see what the words were. It was essentially about when we pray over someone like Francois and this guy, Michel, we help them disconnect, dissolve the ties between their peri spirit and their physical body. Prayer with the, through the connection to on high helps dissolve the ties. And we're venturing to say that it is related to why we're being asked to pray for this spirit too because obviously he is still more connected to his body than is comfortable for him. So that completes, ah, I wanted to say one more thing. You may know Professor Euripides Barsanofo. It's a difficult word to say for a German. <laughs> so Euripides Barsanofo says something about prayer as well. He says, it's really beautiful and poetic. Prayer is the son of the soul. Prayer is the son of the soul, vivifying and illuminating the road of salvation. Isn't that beautiful, friends? It's the son of the soul. It's similar to what Emmanuel says. It's the mirror of the soul, turning towards the sun. And Professor Barsanofo tells us that the prayer is the sun of the soul, vivifying and illuminating the road of salvation. Prayer is the key to your path, he says, towards God. Prayer is our key to our path towards God. And what is the password for this connection? It is service, friends. To be of service. Being of service, serving others is a form of prayer as well. And it is charity. Prayer is charity and service is charity. And we remember we were reminded that there is no salvation without charity. And that we learn in the gospel according to Spiritism. So our path is pretty clear, isn't it? We know what to do and we are grateful for it. Extremely grateful. So let us wrap up our case. Now let's see. So six years had elapsed since his passing and he still saw himself falling off the tower and being crushed on the stones below. How terrific. Unimaginable to have that sensation for six years. I personally have a really hard time really feeling that. I can't even imagine six years of this repetitive sensation. But I understand it enough to say, mm -mm. Not me, I don't want, never. No, I'm not interested in experiencing that. I don't even want to dive in deep mentally. I'm just so clear this is not, this is not serving us. The void below and the perspective of the fall still terrified him. And that after six years, exclamation mark, they say, how much longer would such a state last? He does not know. And this uncertainty increases his distress. And that is on top of the six years he's already experienced suffering for. He does not know how much longer this will last. Ah, let's take a deep breath. This is, this is hard, isn't it? Hard to imagine. Isn't this like hell with its flames? This actually teaches us that hell is not a specific space somewhere in the beyond where certain souls are being, being sent who so-called sinned. 
No, we know from this book, Heaven and Hell, that there is no specific space. But the so-called hell that we experience is exactly what our friend Francois is going through. That is his personal hell, the repetitive sensation of jumping and falling. And hopefully, and we don't know how long, but he will not last in this hellish state forever. That we know for sure, because there is a benevolent and loving God who always gives us another opportunity. The moment we truly repent from the bottom of our, our, our hearts, help will come. Remember when André Louise, who was in the umbral at the beginning after his, his transition, when he prayed from the bottom of his heart, the helpers came and took him out. That was his moment of repentance, true heartfelt repentance. So who revealed such punishments? Were they invented? No, the very individuals who must endure them are the ones who have come to describe them, just as others have come to describe their joy. And that is what we're learning from these cases. We started off with the joyful spirits, with the happy spirits, and we learned so much. How beautiful, what a beautiful state they were in after their transition, becoming conscious really quickly. It was beautiful. And now we're seeing that the life report, the reality TV, the camera is on the suicide cases. And the suffering that we're learning about is not an imagination. No, this is reality. This is life. This is really happening. And uh, for, for Francois, it's really happening. So dear friends, let us wrap up for tonight. We've learned about the importance of courage from Francois. We learned about the importance of prayer and that the so-called hell is not a place in the beyond where we're stuck forever. No. It is our own personal hell, hell that we create via our thought forms because it's for Francois, it's his thoughts, right? That created the thoughts of jumping and um, falling because it's already actually completed, but his thinking is still going over it and over it. Let us close our eyes if we can and let us, let us thank God and Jesus and the beautiful spirits on high. Alan Kardec, Emmanuel, Neo Lucio, Euripides de Bassanofo, and all the good spirits on high, the spirits that are aligned with the Christ consciousness for their beautiful immortal wisdom coming through, teaching us of how to navigate our lives most effectively. We know we've been here many, 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 many times. And it is in this lifetime that is our great opportunity to learn and practice the good. To wake, waking up, to understanding where we're coming from and why we are here and where we're going and how to prepare for our future. We now know how to plant seeds that will guarantee us a blush and beautiful, pleasant harvest in the future. We're deeply grateful for the important lesson on courage so that we may apply it in our lives every single day. We're equally grateful for the lesson and gift of the nightly review that St. Augustine taught us about, which we will take into our next week. And lastly, prayer. Prayer that is the mirror that connects us with the Son of God, aligning ourselves in body, mind, and spirit with the will of God to always seek goodness to feel goodness, to visualize goodness, and to mold goodness with all the resources we have at hand every single day. To work hard, to forgive, 
to always hope and love everyone and everything. And with this, and with so much gratitude, we ask to be allowed to close tonight's study session. And so be it. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining. I am so grateful for having this opportunity, for being here on Cardiac Radio, nourishing our souls 24 seven with thousands of podcasts, always nourishing our souls. And so God willing, we will see each other again next week, same place with our next case, uh, our next suicide case. God bless you. Good night.